Uh, Alice, a couple of years ago, um, we saw very interesting and actually fairly promising data for uh, efatinib, which is now FDA approved as well, in combination with cetuximab in this setting. Can you comment on that and whether there is a, a current clinical role for this uh, combination? Yep. So we have seen really. Um at the time, what seemed to be quite compelling data with the combination um, in patients, and actually um, the response rate was in the 40, 45 percent range, mm -hmm. and it was actually seen in patients who had T790M as well as patients who did not have T790M, so that was also exciting to us. So it wasn't a predictor, or a, right. a, 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 a discriminant or determinant in That's terms right. of activity. Um, the median PFS was in the four to five month range, um, so somewhat durable responses, but the main issue that we've had um, when we've had patients on this study is toxicity with the combination. Um, you know, efatinib by itself is, is quite toxic in terms of the skin um, and diarrhea issues as well as mucositis. And then in combination with cetuximab, it can be quite, quite challenging. So I think it's a little bit, it's hard, and especially in the era now of these new third generation EGFR inhibitors, which really have such nice, clean profiles, it's very hard for patients with T790M for me to imagine, um, you know, encouraging them to pursue a fatin of cetuximab over one of the newer third generation EGFR inhibitors. Is there a um, trial directly comparing a fatinib to uh, um, either jafitinib or alotinib? Uh, there is the a trial setting? It comparing a fatinib to jafitinib um, uh -huh. in, in Asia. Asia, yes. but not in North America. So. Uh, no, not that I know of. And um, to date, none of these agents have really resulted in an overall survival advantage. Uh, primarily because, at least in the original phase three trials, the control group receiving chemotherapy would cross over. That's right. So it's completely confounded um, by the crossover. Is there any plan for a meta-analysis, perhaps, combining all these trials? Do you think that that, that would be a logical uh, maneuver, uh, considering yeah, I mean, the trial designs were essentially identical? Right. That could be done, or often we re rely on retrospective you know, analyses, historical controls, to try and establish an overall survival or at least support an overall survival benefit. So there's an there's a abstract, at, again, at ASCO 2014, doing almost exactly as you suggested for a fatinib, uh, which Alicia Sequist, I think, is leading, which um, is at least the abstract claims that by looking across several different afatinib-based randomized studies, they are able to show some overall survival difference. In uh, one of the uh, mutations, I believe, as opposed to both, or in both? Uh, you probably know more than I, me. I, I don't know. I think it was for one. I, I think it may be in just the, the deletion XO19. 19. Yeah, which mm -hmm. would be the first time, if it's true, if it, can, if it holds up over time, that we've actually seen a survival advantage. Well, but also remember that even on the chemotherapy arms, the crossover wasn't 100%. So, you know, you have 100% of patients getting the drug a that's TKI highly front. effective for them. And even the number I remember is in the URTAC trial. Um, I think 16% of the patients on the chemo arm never crossed over mm -hmm. to erlotinib. And so that's the tragedy to me is that those patients don't get the most effective drug in terms of response and PFS benefit. Um, so you can't rely on this, well, if I don't treat it first line, I'll treat it second line. Uh, so I don't have to test you, them. You don't you, know you, for you, sure yeah. if you'll get to second Right, line. exactly, exactly. We saw the same issue with crizotinib in yeah. um, 1007, where yeah. about 13% of patients who were randomized to chemo didn't end up crossing end over up, yeah. because of yeah. progression. Yeah. Yeah. Covenant, if you could comment on other mechanisms of resistance here, uh, met as a potential pathway, and uh, what other strategies might exist? Sure, absolutely. I think um, uh, meta-amplification meta appears to be one other known <laughs> pathway, but I don't think we have really fully understood what happens uh, in the EGFR mutant patients uh, in terms of what are the subclones have evolved over time uh, before treatment and what others evolve after treatment. So I think we only have a keyhole view of what's happening. We need to have the panoramic view by doing these large-scale genomic studies, and, and we and others are planning to do this in a pad specimen, so that'll give us an answer. If you may add quickly one more thing, we've been talking about overall survival. There are now two trials being planned in the early stage lung cancer. One is the large alchemist study where patients with early stage non-small cell lung cancer will be screened for EGFR mutation and alfusion. And if they have EGFR mutation, they'll get standardized therapy followed by placebo or standardized therapy followed by erlotinib. And in fact, there is an ongoing study conducted by RTOG and Alliance Cooperative Group in stage three setting, again, same population, EGFR mutant alk. And uh, we just opened the trust trial only a few months ago, and already there are five patients on this trial as of uh, a couple of weeks ago. There's certainly so a pent-up uh, That's desire absolutely. I'm very impressed that we already got two patients. patients. So these two will really address the question, can we start curing patients? And it'll be, a, it'll be wonderful to have the, the third-generation drugs 
without side effects in this population. But again, given the development process, we have to do with a lot. Of the uh, study in locally advanced is uh, really just induction or neoadjuvant, three months. Right. Do you have concerns about the duration of therapy? I mean, uh, if we look at the uh, select trial in the adjuvant setting, uh, where Lotnib was given for two years in uh, uh, EGFR mutants who had undergone resection. It seems like uh, folks did fine for the first two years, and then there was a, a, a sudden drop in uh, progression-free survival that we saw a lot of uh, progression at that point, a lot of recurrence. It's a great question, and we agonized over this quite a bit. And so we actually came up with the least bad option. And, uh, you know, we learned from the SWOG study that maintenance gefitinib following chemo radiation resulted in worse outcome. Granted, this was an unselected patient. We were very concerned, burned by that experience, with a lot of hesitation putting the allotinib in the consolidation phase. And then during the concurrent chemo radiation phase, some of the small studies have not shown such promising results. So we decided to reduce the tumor bulk by giving it in the first three months. And the idea is whatever clones that survive will now be hit with chemotherapy and radiation Our standard in order approach. to cure standard approach. And that's the rationale for that. May not be ideal, but we thought we'll start off with that. But yeah. I, I do think it's important in these trials that we have a control arm that does not contain a targeted agent because we don't know how these targeted populations do on standard of care. There's they some may evidence. Do better. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, right. There's some evidence Absolutely. that the, the EGFR mutants may do a lot better with chemo Absolutely. radiotherapy than the average. Uh, Patient. And if and when they recur, they'll get the uh, right. uh, TKI at that point. So and, and, and one thing we've learned in early stage, whether it's in the surgical setting uh, or in the chemo radiotherapy setting, that, that downstaging, you know, having a response um, either in the nodes or the primary tumor is a very good predictor um, for overall survival. Uh, and probably what's happening, either this is a population that doesn't have occult micrometastatic disease or their occult micrometastatic disease is quite sensitive. Uh, to that early intervention. So, you know, I, th I think that you're right, we did argue a lot about the study design, but you have to draw the line somewhere, and I think the, these are reasonable approaches. Right, this is the Neo Dillman study. I just <laughs> yeah, made that right. up. And yeah. in the molecular targeted age. I you think know, you have to remind the, some of the audience members what the Dillman, the Dillman trial, trial was. was <laughs> the, very, the pioneering study where the induction chemotherapy was given before radiation treatment versus radiation alone that set the whole stage for chemo radiation. Yeah, it was really just five weeks of treatment. Cancer. It was weekly five vinblastin and two doses of cisplatin. First time we began to be A regimen we never cure. use in this day and age. Exactly. <laughs> Alice, any concerns in your part about the duration of treatment, particularly as we try to export these agents to the curative setting? Um, <clears throat> in the ad adjuvant setting yes, using these? Or yes, or in locally advanced. Yeah. Well, I think, as we heard, we just don't have enough data yet, but long-term use, um, certainly, of, of TKIs could, could be problematic. We know with crizotinib, for example, there are some long-term issues um, that, have, that have shown up, including pretty severe edema at times. Um, Ross's group has shown um, issues with um, endocrine in issues with testosterone. So I think over the long term, you do have to think a little bit about potential side effects. So even after we control diarrhea and help mitigate the skin toxicity, right. there are other issues. There could be that others that come up long-term. Um...